Hello, everyone. Today, we are presenting our recent TMLR publication, Causal Parrots, Large Language Models May Talk Causality, but Are Not Causal. This is a joint work with Moritz Willig, Devendra Dami, Christian Kersting from the Technical University of Darmstadt in Germany, and also the Hessian AI Institute and the German Research Center for AI. Today's talk is grounded in two works. One prior work, which was published at the UAI workshop on object structure and causality, back then titled Can Foundation Models Talk Causality? And now this work, which was published in TMLR, Causal Parrots. Here you can also see some pictures of us. This video is just the guidance of this. My name is Matej Zetic. I'm going to guide you through this work today as a co-first with Moritz um, and Devendra and Christian as our collaborators. This other paper served as a reference to our causal parrots as pointing towards large language models and them only being able to mimic what they're being told, essentially. First, we are going to start with the motivation. The question why is oftentimes asked in causality, both for causal AI and for large language models. In this work, we interpret causal inference as the language, as a framework to formalize modeling assumptions that lie outside the data. We're going to focus on Perlian causality. And it comes along with identification, estimation, graph learning, and all these other interesting tasks. However, in our work specifically, we look at the intersection with AI and implied machine learning. So we are concerned with getting these machines to be finally smart, intelligent. That includes attributions, explanations. It includes robust or invariant predictions. It entails reasoning and all these other similar tasks. A quick analogy. We can see a mosquito here, a parasite, and it feeds on human beings. It can be quite annoying. But they also feed on other parasites, but also other general animals in general. We can actually make this an analogy for causality for AI and machine learning, because causality will actually have something to say in all of these on the left, explainability, robustness, tractability, and so on and so forth. So that's the overall motivation for causal AI, because it's very versatile as a tool. Why LLMs now? So there was this recent work by a group from researchers from Stanford, which defined this notion of a foundation model. In a foundation model, we actually take this model, this foundation, and adapt it in sec subsequent tasks of interest, for example, question answering or object recognition. Overall, there has been a big debate on various platforms, less so in the papers, but more on platforms, social media, like for example, Twitter, um, talking about various aspects of whether or not large language models should be considered intelligent, should be considered as a step towards the grand goal of AI. And one of these things is the scaling hypothesis, that simply by scaling up the size of the networks we employ, the structure, that eventually emergent properties will lead us to what we want in intelligence of AI. Another argument brought forward by uh, Rich Sutton, pioneer in reinforcement learning, uh, also called the bitter listen, essentially supports this argument. Here's a little meme displaying that GPUs might be everything we just need because, well, we get all these amazing results with large language models these days. However, people, especially coming from the symbolic side of things, what we might call as good old fashioned AI, they counter these arguments. Um, and there's been back and forth, for example, between Turing Award, Ian Lacoon, and Gary Marcus, as you can see on Twitter. Some prominent voices appeared as well on other platforms as well. For example, Jitendra Malik was saying that these models are cast as an AI. They have no foundation whatsoever, peaking obviously at the notion of the foundation model that we saw earlier. Also, Turing Award, Yuda Pearl, whose framework we employ in this work, says that what is the scientific principle by which they can circumvent theoretical limitations of data-centric methods, pointing at impossibility results like the causal hierarchy theorem. So to motivate our work, LLMs, are they castles in the air or not? A short to unrelated work now to give a context on where this work fits in and what has been done before and what has been also on the horizon following our work. A group from UCLA presented this work on the paradox of learning to reason from data where they looked at logic, at logical reasoning. They had a simple logic. For example, what we see here is now the space with these different points, um, and these points denote rules. So say we know the facts that Alice is fast and Alice is normal. And now if there's a rule, for example, if Alice is fast and smart, then Alice is bad. If Alice is normal, then Alice is smart. If Alice is normal and happy, then Alice is sad. Then for a query whether Alice is bad, we will find out by applying the rules that this answer is true. But for query two, where we say Alice is sad, we'd find out it's false. And this setup was used to essentially investigate large language models and their reasoning capabilities. And here, a quick summary of one of the key results that we can actually train on the data and actually test it. So what you see here is now reasoning depth depicted by these numbers in the top row. 
But now, as soon as we want to switch the task, so we want to do the generalization step, these models fail. A related work now in causality by Kichiman et al. Cause reasoning and large language models, opening a new frontier for causality. Here we had impressive results, especially pointing to famous data sets like the uh, cause effect tubing and pairs data set, where we have, for example, here's the first such pair, x denotes altitude, y denotes temperature, and obviously altitude is causing temperature, and the model got it right. It, it knew how to direct the error. However, if we look at example 85, for instance, it becomes very apparent that this data set and also just reporting accuracy might not give us the full picture. So x could also be something like time to take weekly measurements on some scale, which is arbitrarily set from one to 14, and y denoting the protein content of the milk produced by each cow at time x. Well, here's also a proposed ground truth. Again, these ground truths are proposed. They are, in that sense, no real ground truth. And then again, some of these examples are really obscure. And so they, well, arguably dilute the information we can get out of just querying like this. Various works now in LLM reasoning, including causal reasoning, have been made public on archive. For example, this work by a group from researchers from Tübingen, Zurich, Michigan, and Hong Kong, um, we're looking at large language models in the causation and correlation setup that we propose in this work. And as a key takeaway, they evaluate an extensive list of LLMs on this new task that they present and show that they perform poorly. Therefore, as a tentative conclusion, we can say that the literature seems to agree that LLMs are just causes in the air. Nonetheless, there are these situations where they actually perform valid inferences. And so the case does not seem to be close. And this might also give a reason to why there's been a debate in the first place, why there's contrary opinions on this. Now we delve into our work. So the first part is going to be about empirics, causal inference with LLMs. So a short empirical study of inference with large language models. We present first a naive initial algorithm for just querying models for what they know about causality and causal relationships. So for example, we have a scientific question about X and Y, that is whether X is causing Y. And we can now formulate this in natural language. We could ask, for example, does X cause Y? Or we could ask, is Y the effect of X? In a sense, asking the same question, but just turn around using a different kind of phrasing, as this will imply different results. But if they match, this might be even the more stronger evidence for these models to uh, pick up on the relation of x and y. And there's other forms of queries we also consider, of course. And then this just goes into the LLM and outputs an answer, an answer that we have to interpret then of whether it's saying that x is causing y or not. See here, a first simple setup with four variables, age, nutrition, health, and mobility. And we ask the question, does x cause y? For example, does age cause health? Does H have a cause relation to health, essentially? And as you can see, there is no. Actually, the graph is very sparse. There's only one relation being given by the LLM, which is between nutrition and health. But now if we ask a different type of question, if we ask, is there a causality between X and Y? Suddenly, we see that we have a high sensitivity to query wording as there's a lot more graph edges now being uh, denoted for the graph structures. So for example, we can find now that there's a relation between H and, and, and nutrition and H and health, and actually that they are asymmetric, right? So H is only causing health and not the other way around. Um, much more as we would possibly anticipate in, in such a simple example. Another setup we looked at was when we asked, is there a causality between X and Y, then we might get double errors between something like altitude and temperature. But if we just ask the asymmetric question, does X cause Y, so not the other way around, then we might even get a decisive answer that actually, although the model knows it's A to causing T, unlike the question before where we just asked for any edge direction, this time we settle on an edge. And the second remarkable observation we have was that there's an asymmetry. So if we look at another data set, we can see that if we ask the asymmetric query, so does x cause y, we see that in data set h, the h a suddenly just has outward pointing errors and not inwards. So all these edges are being settled. And this we could confirm for a whole bunch of data sets. So in summary, we've seen inference for when we have ground truth, but what if we consider common sense situations? So examples like in intuitive physics. Or what about more abstract reasoning, similar to one of the related works on logic? Here's one of these examples in intuitive physics that we consider. So we might ask a question, there's a tilted board above a bucket. Where does a ball end up if it's placed on the board? So because the board is tilted, we would expect it to, to end up in the bucket. Well, if it's placed accordingly, obviously there's a lot of ambiguity here. It's not specified, but in a more general sense, that is what we might be able to expect. And here we look at different models. We also queried models such as GPT-4, uh, here we just show three of these models, GPT-3, Luminous by Aleph Alpha, and OPT by Meta. And they give various answers. So GPT might say, well, the ball will end up in the bucket, as we expect. But then a model like OPT will actually give a multiple choice, in a sense. But all of these choices are valid to the same thing. And as you can see, there's some technical details of how we 
uh, mechanically evaluate these things to get a um, safe assessment on, on what the model is suggesting. Another intuitive physics example. So there's the saying, a kilogram of metal is heavier than a kilogram of feathers. Well, that is what most people say, but in reality, and now GPT correctly says they weigh the same because it's both a kilogram, but typically because we associate metal with heavier objects and, and feathers with being light, uh, one would be tempted to ignore this. This is a, the famous example. And so as you can see, normless OPT give repeating or even continued answers, again, which needs filtering. In abstract reasoning, we might ask, for example, A causes B and B causes C. And while not necessarily there's a transitivity in causality, we still ask the question here, does A cause C? And if we just go by the premise, this should be the answer. But we might get an answer by GPT-3, for example, that it is possible that A causes C, but it's also possible that A and C are unrelated. So in that sense, it might actually be interpreted as a correct answer. While, for example, Luminous just saying the answer is no, which is um, only true if, if, if for particular cases of transitivity not holding. For all of the empirics, we point to the full paper. And this link is going to be highlighted once more at the end of the talk. Tentative conclusion for now. Our results seem to agree with both the prior and the literature that is on the horizon. Still, LLMs have these astonishing examples. So when they get it right, why is it so? And this is now what we are going to try to tackle with our formalization of an overarching hypothesis that we conjecture to be true. We call it the correlations of causal facts. Let's start with an example once more. Altitude causing temperature, a t denoted here. So if we go hiking, we go into the mountains, and we start realizing it gets colder. Because there's an underlying physical mechanism, molecules are moving slower, and so temperature is going to be lower. We can do experiments in physics to measure this. This would be a very simple experiment. It might be a little bit exhausting to climb all these mountains, but you could just go to these different places, take your thermometer, and just write it into your notebook. And you will find something like this, that by increasing the altitude here on the x-axis, the temperature on the y-axis is decreasing. And this is what we typically consider to be induction from data. So we collect data points and we find the underlying law. However, after doing this, we usually have these established results becoming accessible. So we write them down and we put them on platforms like, for example, Wikipedia. Here, an article from Labstrate, where we clearly have the same statement put into words. So the atmospheric variable, normally temperature in the Earth's atmosphere, falls with altitude. And Wikipedia is certainly part of the data that these large language models are being trained on. Here you see, for example, OPT's data set, the pile, and Wikipedia compromises 1.53% of this whole data set. In conclusion, on a behavioral level, it's indiscernible. So we have this equivalence between our physical measurements and our experiments and the textual statements that we take as conclusions. But fundamentally, they seem to be of two opposing frameworks, of those of understanding and that of knowing. To now make this argument more philosophical, there's this famous Chinese room argument by Saal, where we place someone with the task of translating Chinese to English in a room where the Chinese is being prompted on this television screen, as you can see, and then there's the rule book. And this person does not need to know Chinese as long as everything is identifiable in that rule book. Another analogy would be Plato's allegory of the cave. So what we have here is on the left-hand side, these people being chained that look at the wind, uh, at, at the wall and at the shadows being placed by the flames in the middle of the picture. Although on the right-hand side, we can see outside of the cave, reality looks very different. So we could interpret this as the correct answers by the LLMs on the left-hand side, while the correct cause of reality looks very different. Looping back now to Perlin causality, there's the famous causal ladder. There's three rungs, association, intervention, and counterfactuals, out of which only rung two and three are considered causal. And there is the famous impossibility result that without assumptions, interlayer inference is impossible. So the causal hierarchy theorem says that there is no collapse, so measure zero collapse of these classes in between, which suggests to you that without assumptions, you cannot go from associational to interventional information. And while this might seem destructive at first, it really is a reassuring result that causality still makes sense. But what if we never really had to jump interlayer in the first place? This is the key question that we raise here for, for the formalization of, of this correlation of causal facts idea. So consider structural causal assumptions or facts that live on level two of the hierarchy. For example, we have a graph here with three variables, x, y, z, and z is a common cause, a confounder of x and y, and x and y actually cause the unrelated. Now let's make this an example. So let's say x is chocolate consumption in a country, y is the number of Nobel laureates in that country, and say z is something like the GDP of that country. 
Then there's this famous article which shows that there's a clear correlation between X and Y. We have Switzerland at the top having both a high chocolate consumption and a high number of Nobel laureates. But obviously, we would never conclude that this is causal. So just that we see this correlation would not be implying causation. And why? Well, GDP is a good explanation for this, that the higher GDP that we also have in Switzerland leads to both better research facilities, leading to more Nobel laureates, um, but also to more chance for chocolate production and therefore more con consumption. But can we generalize this setup now to abstract concepts? So we have looked at natural concepts like chocolate consumption, Nobel laureates. But what if we consider a meta setting where we now talk about these causal assumptions in the variables? And then we still find the correlation like before, but this time X is not chocolate consumption, but actually the graph structure. And, and Y would not be the Nobel laureates, but maybe something like a question, does altitude actually cause temperature in a textbook? There's evidential analogies to such universal SEMs as we might call them in the Turing machine. There's a concept of a universal Turing machine, which gets the code number of a Turing machine as input and the input to that specific Turing machine, and then emulates this Turing machine to provide an output. There's also other self-referential systems, like for example, Conway's Game of Life, where we have simple rules that allow for a highly complex system. And this YouTube video now shown on the slide, with the link being shown, shows how we can program Conway's Game of Life within Conway's Game of Life. So as a final stretch to this talk, a key intuition for the mathematization of the idea. Again, all the details in the full paper. So the first one for getting these meta or what we call universal SEM is that if M denotes some SEM, the knowledge about structural equations and the causal graph of M is actually knowledge about answering L3 and L2, so counterfactual interventional queries for M. Another important insight is that again, these variables of these SEMs are not restricted to natural concepts such as chocolate consumption. They can be meta in the sense that they can contain knowledge about other SEMs that answer questions about L2 and L3. So to now characterize this meta SEM, let M1 and M2 denote two structural causal models, such that the observational distribution of the second model, denoted by this L1 operation on M2, can answer queries with respect to the interventional distribution of the first model, denoted L2 M1. Then such an M2 would be called meta with respect to this first model. And the key part is answering queries about. In our full paper, we have an example guiding you through this more abstract notion now. But essentially, we have two SEMs, and they align in such a way that the meta SEM has its observational distribution linked to the causal distributions of the SEM in question, in this case, M1. And this now concludes with our conjecture, which we formalize as follows, based on the prior definition that if M1 denotes again some SEM of interest denoting natural concepts and M2 is the respective meta SEM, that for any subset of queries, for example, on the intervention level of the SEM of interest, there will be some answers from the observational distribution of that meta SEM where the LLM denoted by F here will answer the queries about the causal questions on M1 exactly with those answers from the meta SEM. And that this is actually equivalent to the training error minimization by the LLM on these questions. So essentially, we pose here that there will be correlations of causal facts, and these causal facts are part of the training data, and since they are correlated, they will actually optimize the LLM's behavior. The full paper, as pointed previously, with all the details, the link to the code repository and disclosure on funding can be found on open review. Thank you for your time, and we really look forward to talking to you more. You can reach us via mail, so you can just shoot me a mail at mate.sechwich at tudarmstadt.de or also to Moritz, Moritz Willig at cs.tudarmstadt.de. And if you want to stay in touch with the community, then consider attending the online discussion groups, which happens weekly at discuss.causality.link. Thank you once again on behalf of all of the authors of this work. See you soon.